dass ihr wieder mit dabei seid und wir kommen jetzt zu einem Highlight dieses Digital Social Summit. Wir kommen nämlich zur ersten Keynote bei unserem Summit und äh, wir schalten jetzt nach Kalifornien, denn da kommt unsere Gästin her, Lucy Bernholz vom Digital Civil Society Lab an der Stanford University und die Keynote wird auf Englisch sein. Ähm, wir haben aber eine Live-Untertitelung für euch. Das heißt, wenn ihr bei dem Livestream-Fenster mal ganz nach links schaut, da gibt es einen kleinen Button. Den könnt ihr also klicken, um die Untertitelung anzuschalten und unten drunter in diesem schwarzen Bereich, da gibt es auch so ein kleines Häkchen. Genau, da haben wir es eingekreist und da könnt ihr auch noch einmal die Sprache auswählen, die ihr braucht. Und ja, worum soll es denn jetzt eigentlich gehen bei Lucy? Also Lucy wird über digitale Zivilgesellschaft sprechen und die Zukunft der Demokratie. Und so viel kann ich schon mal verraten. Es wird ein sehr eindringlicher Appell werden, denn die digitale Zivilgesellschaft, die ist nicht einfach da, sondern man muss sie erschaffen und man muss sie vor allen Dingen auch erhalten, wenn man die Demokratie stärken möchte. Und deshalb ist das auch das Stichwort für euch, denn wir wollen auch, dass ihr euch beteiligt. Wir haben im Anschluss noch Zeit für ein paar Fragen an Lucy, also schreibt sie gerne in das Fragentool und dann kann ich sie im Nachhinein noch einmal aufgreifen und an Lucy weiterreichen. So for now, um, let's say hi to Lucy. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here and we are very happy and very excited to get an insight on your perspectives. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's, the, it's great to see you all. Um, I'm hoping you can see the slides. Every, can I get a thumbs up that you can see everything? Okay, um, so uh, I'm calling in from California uh, and uh, from the land, the ancestral lands of the Rame Tushaloni. It's delightful to be with you here uh, today. In 2019, I was able to be with you in person. So that was, um, I think the difference between then and now is a good signal of all that we've been through uh, in the time that's allotted. And I wanna um, give people a chance to both uh, center and pay attention to all that's going around us in the world, but also to draw on hope. Because I'm here today to talk a little bit about what digital civil society can and must uh, do for us going into the immediate future, how we can step into the futures we want. And I believe deep in my heart and uh, with all of my uh, knowledge that it will be in fact digital civil society and all of us, all of you who are here today, who will help us figure out um, how to strive toward the futures that we want, because we are here You are here, I am here uh, out of um, a commitment to the very kind of hope that Octavia Butler told us to uh, center on that the very act of looking to the future of trying to shape the present and understand the future is itself uh, an act of hope. And I wanna work with and from that um, insight as we go forward. So I've got sort of three or four big points to make about digital civil society, and then I'm eager to be in conversation with you. Um, the first thing I wanna start with is that digital civil society is all of us. Every one of you who's here today to listen to me and to speak with each other and to join as part of this summit um, is a part of digital civil society. We are the ones who along with our neighbors and our colleagues um, can, can take Uh, can take our core principles of democratic futures, look around at all of the migration and flux that is going on in our world, all of our new neighbors, all of the people, ourselves included, whose lives have been um, completely upended in the last few years or the last few months, and realize that if we are going to find our way forward, if we're going to build the futures we want, uh, it comes down to the work and the ways that we live, each and every one of us, individually and collectively. And then in fact, we have what we need to do this. We are familiar uh, across Europe and here in the United States with the core principles of self-governance and autonomy and of being able to build the uh, democratic futures that we're looking for. We, are, we look around us and we see new neighbors new arrivals, new friends, new colleagues. And we realize that not only do they bring with them 
the energy and the desire and the intention and the need to create positive new futures. They bring the wisdom and insights uh, of, of their own home culture, of their own um, pursuits of democratic and fair and just futures, and that they are the invigorating energy and we are the invigorating energy that we need, in fact, to build from um, the pieces of digital civil society that we've got to, in fact, create a world, recreate a world, protect a world that is our own um, thriving global community on a planet that we have, in fact, committed ourselves to preserving and protecting, no longer extracting from and dividing us around. In doing this, we have to recognize what is at the core of digital civil society? Where does it fit in our understanding of the world? And what can, it, what can we do as part of it? What in fact distinguishes digital civil society from what we've had in the past? And there are a couple of things here that I want to remind you of, because I know that you know this, but I want you to remind you of the power of these possibilities and to in fact grab them. So let me do that by introducing you to a friend of mine, a woman I met uh, in the past couple of years named Kat Chang. Kat is a native Hawaiian. She is, uh, was raised on the islands and then moved to the uh, mainland United States as a, as, a, as a teenager. But she is deeply invested in the natural world around her. She works as a landscape architect, but she also um, studies and tries to understand um, mushrooms and soil at the very root of the, of the world we live in, the mud in which lotuses grow. And Kat got very excited about understanding mushrooms, uh, which are this extraordinary um, rejuvenating, connecting network um, of, of all of life actually built into the soil. And as she did this, she started to take photographs of mushrooms and she found her way accidentally into being a practitioner of what is one of the most um, potentate uh, 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 new resources we have, which is the ability to actually donate digital data, which in, in Europe has been referred to as data altruism. What we're referring to here is data raising, which is this understanding that we as individuals can in fact have a kind of control and decision-making authority over our digitized data in ways that would allow us to actually see new problems, see problems in new ways and seek new solutions. So what Kat does is she donates these photographs of mushrooms. On the one hand, it is this small act, um, but it is indicative of the power that we all have. By Kat donating her photographs of mushrooms to an app called iNaturalist, this is just one act that each of us can take that, and, and millions of us, this is the, the right-hand picture you're looking here is the contributors to iNaturalist from Germany, a million and a half people uh, who have donated their own ground level observations of the flora and fauna around them that they see as they go through their days, as they try to understand, but what they're building when you donate these photographs with each contribution of these photographs, what you're doing is making a small grain of sand contribution to a knowledge changing data set about the health of our planet. That's what iNaturalist is powering with each of our small contributions. They add up to this data set that allows scientists and people around the world to understand just what is happening uh, on our planet, where we are as well as where others are. And it is with that kind of knowledge that we can begin to find both new scientific solutions to the climate change we've brought upon ourselves, but also new community level solutions. We can connect with people in our own region as well as around the world to join together and take action to try to uh, to, not just to try, but to succeed in making our planet a place that can continue to sustain us. And it all starts with this tiny act of donating a digital photograph. It is a smallest step. Each of us can do it, but we need to understand what actually is possible from it. 
and as Kat has been doing this now for over a decade, we'll see that in fact, all around us, there are others. We are part of a community of people and organizations that is redesigning, reimagining what civil society can be at its organizational level, as you see on the screen here with some examples of new nonprofit structures, data trusts and data collectives that are built to actually purpose built to manage digitized data for the kinds of solutions we're looking for. So we're both empowered with this new ability and responding to that new ability by designing new organizational forms. Just as hundreds of years ago, our predecessors built up co-ops and mutual organizations and not-for-profit organizations to say we have these resources, which we use, want to use collectively. We're in that explosive moment of birthing new organizations, again, new organizational structures. And is with that power, that is the, the pathway we have to instill in those organizations and what we build, those very principles of autonomy, self-governance, privacy, the core roots that allow us to function as coherent, fair, and just societies. And it's not just happening in individual places. The examples I give you here of data for black lives and data trust, these are nodes but they are connected across the globe. And again, we've been seeing this for a decade and I wanna call it out as this potential explosive new power of positivity, of networked action that connects different kinds of expertise, different regional access, different kinds of domain experience from the lived experience and expertise to deep data mining and certain kinds of journalistic skills. But you see here these global networks that are allowing us in almost real time to understand what's happening. Uh, we see it, it's reshaping journalism. It is reshaping civil society. These networks of newly formed organizations purpose built to manage and learn from and create solutions from digitized data shared under the rules and um, norms that we in fact put on them, not that are put on them by either governments or by the corporations who control so much of our um, digital data. And it's not just these organizational level structures that are changing, that we are, re that we are inventing all around us. It's actually the very tactics of civil society of action, of both advocacy, of research, and in fact, of policy change. We see organizations like the Workers Info Exchange in the United Kingdom using data subject access requests as a way to create mirror databases of the corporate control, uh, the corporate uh, bosses of gig workers uh, and rideshare drivers to in fact be able to build new ways of thinking about those services, empower those individual workers and re-establish their collective um, autonomy and collective power through the use of a digital derived right, an actual new right we've, we have as humans to see and control and take action over data that is owned on us. So here you've got both a new organization and a new tactic. And our new tactics don't end with this use of these policy derived access requests. We're also uh, working with engineers, engineers and experts within um, the field uh, of, of algorithmic auditing are showing us that in fact, while companies and governments and vendors would like us to think that we can't possibly understand what's going on as, as they use these same resources. They are showing us people like Deb Raj uh, from the Mozilla Foundation are showing us that in fact, yes, we can. We can build inside the companies and outside companies. We can build throughout digital civil society, the very ability to understand better what the algorithms that are using to make public decisions are doing to, require those uh, processes 
to follow the analog values of justice and fairness and transparency, to put in place new powers of destruction to make sure that um, harmful algorithms are not used uh, beyond uh, the, the initial purpose. And in fact, the Digital Freedom Fund there in Europe has been uh, leading the way in strategic litigation and empowering others to take action. So all of this is happening around us um, every day and it's easy to overlook and think that these are one-offs, but by no mean, are, by, by no means what I want to instill in you is that these are the early shoots of spring. These are examples of what is to come, of what we can do when we are, when we stop and reflect on our ability as actors in civil society, as individuals and collectives, as existing nonprofits, as funders, as um, informal networks of concerned individuals who are worried about um, welcoming in new neighbors, uh, preserving the planet, working for justice, um, feeding the hungry, whatever it is, there are ways now that we as civil society can stop, take a breath and say, we have what we need. We have the capacity to mobilize and organize and to use our existing analog resources, but also to create a digital world that embodies and is built on the principles of fairness, justice, self-governance and autonomy upon which we've built modern democracies and for which we are uh, seeking um, to re reinvigorate and reinstill those same processes. And our lives, our very lives depend on us. Our very lives of the planet and of individual people require us to take big steps now toward building um, institutions and, and activities that recognize our fundamental dependence on digital data and the way it is analyzed. And as Timnit Gebru has done in response to um, her own lived realization that in fact, big companies were are never going to be the source of this kind of innovation. Governments are never going to be the source of the kind of values-driven, purpose-built institutional creation we are where that's going to build, come from. And as Timnit has built the new distributed AI research center, so must we empower ourselves with the same kind of vision and resources to do this. But I also want as an historian to remind us that with all of our great new power, we have to be thinking of what happens when time goes by and mistakes are made. We can never really, there's not a single path dependent future. We can do our very best, but as Jenny Holzer will remind us, we live the surprise results of old plans. And simply grasping at these tools as um, tech solutions to existing problems will lead us uh, nowhere positive. We have to lead with community and to recognize that it's digital civil society and its values and our values of uh, humanity and community and de democracy that need to be built into what we do. We've lived here in the US, we can see through the example of things like crisis text line, what happens when the mental models or the logic of uh, corporatism and capitalism or the logic of surveillance becomes dominant. Our best intentions of using digitized data to provide uh, uh, resource and recourse for individuals can go wildly wrong because it's not, what needs to be invented here is not just the technology. In fact, the technology exists, the infrastructure exists, the, the resources and the wisdom of the, of the data world all exist. What we need to lead with and what we need to wrap around and infuse and empower and engird and, and, and create from is actually a commitment to democracy, is actually an understanding of how do we as individuals, how do we as collectives wish to live? How do we um, protect and embody in our technology and in our organizational forms and in the new norms of digital civil society? How do we lead with a commitment to those human rights of uh, autonomy, self-governance, 
and privacy. That's what we must build from it is that commitment that distinguishes digital civil society from its predecessor. And it is all that commitment, those human commitments, those value commitments, those purpose commitments that in fact will not only allow us to create um, new community-based and um, globally networked um, aspirational solutions, but will in fact invigorate and design and infuse democracy as we go forward. Because we cannot and we will not and we are not actually simply trying to carry into the future the models we have known from the past. We are trying to create new beautiful visions that instantiate things that have always been marginalized and put those at the center. They take the values of pluralism and the values of justice and design organizations, activities, networks, rules, and norms that are in fact better models than those we've ever had, that actually live the values that have been rhetorically referred to, but substantively designed to ignore. We have the opportunity to build those using the, the networks and the data that we have, but only, only if we lead from that very lived experience of those who, for whom the future is actually their history. We've been living the, the mistakes and, and we're now in a position to actually capitalize on and lead from that human heart, that human power, that connect commitment to justice and fairness that allows us a voice and a thriving pluralistic community and in fact, the pursuit of democratic leadership, such as uh, is necessary to meet the challenges of our time. Thank you for joining me here today and I look forward to being in conversation with you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I have a question. Um, this data of altruism, those uh, donated data, is this something we are actually in need of or shouldn't we be in need? Uh, and how much is this a matter of privacy? Yeah, there's huge privacy implications here. And what it, I, I challenge us all to think about is what are the larger systems that are in place that currently have us sort of locked in to this model in which the sharing of data is inherently a privacy violation. That is a, we're absolutely in that place, but we don't need to be there. We can imagine alternative ways of governing that data of generating that data and of using that data in which we as individuals would, ha would have the authority and the agency and the opportunity to determine when and if, or if and when we want to contribute it for some shared social solutions. Now this gets, this gets very big. This gets beyond um, the way we've structured capitalism uh, and the way we built these digital systems, but we have that opportunity, in fact, that imperative to imagine that. And we're doing it on small scales, the, example I've, the examples I've shown you, and we can in fact imagine what would be different if, if the privacy violations that we're so finally attuned to were in fact alternative trade-offs between um, uh, sharing with trusted institutions that we, in our, we ourselves have authority over versus having our data taken from us and used in ways that we have no agency over. So um, how can we, as a civil society, install useful data collections and uh, whose task is this in particular? It's every organization's task at this point because there's not an organization out there that isn't somehow digitally dependent and therefore isn't already um, collecting data. What the decision-making that needs to happen by those groups, whether it's a formal organization or an informal group of people taking on a temporary action is to determine at the get-go, what are you going to do with the data that you're now stewarding? It's not a choice of will there be data collected? It's a choice of how conscious and deliberate are you going to be in stewarding that resource. Now, there, there's a the full spectrum of choices then. You can choose to um, uh, use 
none of the data that you're going to be generated by your very actions, in which case you need to come up with a set of plans and, 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 and practices that minimize and, and reduce that data generation. Or you might go to the far extreme, in which case, as the crisis text line example shows us, you and those you're leading with need to imagine and communicate and design with those from whom you're collecting the data, a, a complete 360 degree circle of what are you going to do with it and how are you going to protect it and what's going to be allowable and what's not. This is, goes far beyond the, the first step of compliance, which in Europe you're all very familiar with, but to really imagining a commitment to the collection of that data that's driven by and has agency for those who are in the data. Remember the data we care about is data about people. Those are people in there. They're capable of being part of the decision-making process. And depending on what uh, you know, domain you're working in, then comes that very deliberate and difficult act of determining the loyalty that your group will have to the people who are represented in that data and working from that vision forward. It can't be an afterthought. It has to be a complete set of actions at the very beginning. So let's take it one step further. So what legislations are needed, um, maybe inside the EU, to accomplish this goal? I don't know. I don't know. But you know. The people at the summit know. Your living and thriving and designing and, and changing and, and, and affect, most affected by the European regulatory environment, um, you also know what uh, problems you're trying to solve. All of civil society in Europe needs to engage in these policy conversations. It's very much the right question. And all I can offer to you is to say that the extraordinary work of those in Europe who see themselves as part of the digital rights community needs to be augmented by the wisdom and experience of those in Europe for whom the rest of civil society that doesn't necessarily see themselves as part of that digital rights world, that expertise and that proximal understanding, preferably the lived experience of those who are trying to be helped, of those whom civil society seeks to help, to bring all of that expertise together to inform that regulatory question. I don't know the answer to that question, but the wisdom to figure it out is right here in this community. So if we take it back to the US, and this is my last question for you, is um, what would be your utopia of a digital civil society um, that serves a digital democracy? It's one in which each of us as individuals understands that we have, understands and can act on the way our um, vision of a just future manifests itself. That we know we can and that we have access to the pathways, whether that's as an organization in civil society, whether it's through our informal associations, whether it's our actions as a voter and an engaged citizen in the formal mechanics of our democracy, but that we are both aware and have access to the pathways to take those steps, whether it be about new legislation, whether it be about new solutions to uh, homelessness, whether it be about um, visions of a more uh, of a democracy that follows the rule of law, which in my country right now is the key question, um, but that each of us knows we can and in fact takes that step forward. Right now, far too many of us have been told and are, are under life demands that say you can't, but we need to shift that sense of uh, uh, that open the doors for that. So thank you very much, Lucy Bernholz. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here as a guest.